Hello, and welcome to the Mobile Accessible Games interview series. I'm your host, Aaron Spelker. Mobile Accessible Games is a group that's dedicated about all things about mobile accessible gaming. And through our interview series, we interview game developers, accessibility influencers, as well as accessibility advocates. And this week, we have a game developer who is about to release a new IP on November 15th. It's called Evidence 111. And we have Tom Oramas. Um, from Play by Ears here to talk to us about his new game, Evidence 111. So, Tom, welcome. Hi, everyone. So, Tom, I always like to just kind of kick off uh, the interview with, you know, level setting for the community members. You know, who are you? Um, you know, how, are, how did you get into gaming? So, just like a little uh, bio about yourself. Uh, so, um, um, I'm one of the founders for a company, Play by Ears, with my friend uh, Michael. And we are based in uh, Czech Republic in uh, Prague. And uh, I think as most of the game developers, uh, we are avid uh, gamers. And uh, I think it was the original yeah. try to bring something. So uh, yeah, it's, uh, maybe one thing Michael is basically behind all the technical stuff in the game. And uh, I'm a sound designer, like it's my primary job. And so I'm taking care of uh, things regarding to audio and uh, you know these uh, design things. In the uh, in the Prague community, is there like a, a community of indie game developers in Prague, or, or are you kind of on your own figuring all this stuff out? Yeah, I think it's uh, there are definitely like uh, quite a quite a few game developers in Prague, and I think uh, the community here is quite uh, quite working. Like I, I know a few of them, and we got some meetings. Also, uh, at the moment, there is a new uh, university program for game designers. So also, there's kind of place where uh, a lot of uh, people from in the community meet. So yeah, I think it's. Very really, uh, nice here regarding the community and the indie game development. Oh, that's excellent. Um, so you have a new game coming out on November fifteenth. It's called Evidence One One One. Why don't we just take a little bit uh, moment here and tell people, you know, what's that game about? What is the the basic uh, plot of that game? So uh, basically, uh, we call it interactive audio story and. Uh, uh, the idea is that you can listen to a story and decide what's going to happen next. So kind of like uh, choose your own adventure, you know, or uh, maybe audio game book. And uh, the basic plot uh, is about uh, Chief Inspector Alice Wells. It's set in the UK in 80s. And uh, she's being blackmailed by some unknown, uh, unknown person and uh, about some things in her history. And uh, her task is to... Uh, take uh, from the police uh, station evidence number 111 and bring it to the uh, old uh, Harbor Watch Hotel where she should meet the blackmailer and hand in and the evidence. So this kind of basic plot, and I maybe would not uh, tell much more about it, you know, so sure. you can explore on your own. <laughs> yeah, it has some some good twists and turns and kind of a, uh, a mystery within a mystery. So, you know, definitely... Uh, you don't want to spoil anything in that, but you know, if you being in you know Prague, Czech Republic, why did you settle it? Uh, you know, set the story in England. Why not do it in Prague? <laughs> well, uh, this is quite quite a story because we actually uh, did a Czech version of this game two years ago. It was our kind of kickoff, and now we are doing it in English. And uh, the origin of the story was set in the uh, United States, in uh, Maine, and you know this kind of because uh, we are. Uh, even our writer and me, we are a big fans of Stephen King, you know, so it was kind of a reference to his locations. But it's, kind we, of, uh, it's kind of funny that you say that because when you, when the story was telling, you know, before I realized it was in England, I mean, there were some hints because they say constable as opposed to policeman, but um, I got very, very main vibes uh, from it. So that's kind of funny that that's uh, that you mentioned that. that that's Yeah, I, I, I think it's less likely like it's still in, even in the British British setting. But uh, yeah, and, and we started working on the English version. Uh, it's mainly because of the actors, because uh, they are from UK and it kind of didn't work like listening to the British accent and thinking that we are in the US. So we decided to move the story to UK. Uh, and I think it works as well. Like uh, it's, it's, I think the place is not as crucial for the story. So we made, made a decision to move it there to some old Victorian hotel on some remote island. <laughs> so when you do that, so you, you've kind of now 
did a regional shift, right, uh, from the UK or from the US to the UK. I mean, how much of the story are you really changing? Is it just simple kind of vernacular, like instead of saying police woman, you're saying constable or chief inspector? Or are you changing the name of the hotel? You know, one of one of the characters is from Glasgow. So was that, you know, you probably had to change where that person was from, you know, because they were probably somewhere in the United yeah. States. Is it just little things like that? Well, most of the change is very related, as, as you were saying, like to this region specific, uh, you know, po police ranks. Uh, we are thinking since we are in England, we started playing with accents. Like you know, one uh, the police officer is from Glasgow, so we made him this like really uh, intense Scottish accent. Uh, then there's the Reverend who is from the US, so we got American accent. So uh, it also helps, like you know, when you are listening to the story, to differentiate between the characters that you know they each of them talks a little bit differently. But uh, yeah, regarding the story, there is nothing like crucial change. This really like these small things to make the uh, setting believable. What what made you tell this particular story? Like where where was the origin, or how did you think up of this this particular you know mystery, if you will? Um, well, I, I think this the question for our writer Vladia, who uh, who come up with the idea. Uh, so I um, I don't think I could answer it, but uh, yeah, I, I think it's his uh, it's his uh, love to mystery and detective story. So kind of made up this this uh, this idea. So when when the writer you know thinks up of the story, does he come with it you know fully fledged to you and say you know this is the story we're going to tell, or is it you know I have an outline and a framework and you kind of work together to fill in the beats and you know the the set pieces and things like that. Well, I think we got like three stages. The first was that uh, he made, I think, two or maybe three, kind of, you know, just one page uh, drafts, uh, what could be uh, some kind of synopsis of the story. And from, from that, we choose the, the evidence. And then he made uh, really like the skeleton of the story because, uh, you know, when we are doing a story that's kind of branching, it's uh, really difficult you know, to keep it somehow organized. So uh, we are using the twines with very, very kind of like created nodes and, you know, link them between themselves. So uh, the next move was that he created a skeleton in, in the twine where, you know, he could like jump through the story. There are no dialogues, just, you know, like now happens this, when you go over there, it happens something else. And uh, when we kind of, you know, went through the skeleton, I said, okay, this is good. Then he started writing like all the dialogues and all the situations and so. And, you know, as you kind of mentioned, there's kind of various branching paths and, and different ways to get to an ending of which there, at least from my playthrough, I think I got to, to three or four different endings. You know, how many potential endings are there in the game? Well, in total, there's uh, 11 combinations, like oh, wow. 11 different endings. And also, uh, because some endings got these, uh, uh, I'd say there are like eight main endings and some of them got, uh, this post credits scene. So after the ending credits, based on your decisions throughout the game, you may you know unlock some something more or may not. So like in total, there's uh, eleven variations. Oh, now I feel bad because I think uh, I think the first time <laughs> the credits, yeah. <laughs> well, the first time I listened through all the credits because exactly before that, you know, I'm waiting for the uh, you know the Marvel Cinematic Universe where after the uh, the credits, there's a little show and, and nothing happened on the whatever my first playthrough was. So after that, <laughs> just, I just I just skipped it. Uh, so it's just um, in some of them, but if you skip the credits, you can basically you know skip the, uh, to the next segment in the game. So if there's something you, you you listen to it. You know, if you skip the credits, it won't put you on the very end, but to the uh, post credit scene. All right. Well, I'm gonna have to. So I got to four. So I'm missing out on about seven any So I might pick your brain afterwards, <laughs> uh, just out of curiosity. Uh, so, you know, you are, are obviously, you know, making this game, you know, what's kind of your background in computer programming and, and you know, uh, telling stories like this? Is this your first game? Have you made other games? You know, what's kind of that uh, programming background that you have? Yeah, it's a, uh, it's our first game, if I don't count the, the Czech version. And as, as I mentioned, um, like the most of the technical things is uh, is being Michael as he is working in Unity and I'm just like supplying him with uh, audio data uh, because we are all the audio stuff is happening in the F mode middleware. So basically I'm working in F mode, he's working in Unity and just like exchanging uh, all the assets. But uh, I got some background programming as well. Like I did uh, some course on university. So it makes us 
easier easier for us, you know, to communicate about things that uh, I know what's kind of possible, you know, that there are some restraints and uh, yeah, so it's easier, but I don't want to like, you know, uh, get to uh, writing any code or uh, uh, even seeing a code because <laughs> there's still a lot of things, other things to do. So it's uh, solely up to Michael. So you, you know, you mentioned yourself, you mentioned uh, the, the coder and the writer, is there, other people on the team or is that the, 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 the you know bulk of what makes up play by ears yeah well it's uh me and michael and then there's uh, like Vladia who wrote the story and uh, also we got other people like who helped us you know throughout the development but uh the core of the team is probably me and michael like you know we spent most most of the time with the project and working on it now you have a, a series of voice actors who um, you know, voice the, the various different char characters. And, you know, I was very impressed. You know, sometimes you get these uh, audio games and the, the voice acting is very stilted or very, you know, not, you know, kind of not connected to each other. You don't feel like the two characters are in the same scene with each other. I, I felt it was very natural, uh, you know, what those voice actors did and how they had their inflections and also playing through it multiple times, how they took the same words, but kind of made them have a different feeling to them. Um, you know, tell me a little bit about, you know, who are the voice actors and, you know, and how you kind of got connected with them. Is it just kind of a, a put out, I need a voice actor and they applied, or did you have some other connection to these people? Well, so the, uh, main character, Elizabeth, uh, she's, uh, voice acted by uh, Zoe Robbins. And it's, uh, also quite a story because she's uh, from New Zealand. And, uh, at the time we were doing the game, they were, uh, they are shooting the Wheel of Time series here in Prague. And from time to time, she was coming to our studio uh, for some ADR sessions. So, and I really loved her voice. It was very like uh, the one I think really would fit for the character. So I uh, talked with her about it a little bit and uh, then contacted her agent and you know, she said uh, that she would uh, do it. And that was the similar case with the with Rosamund Pike, who is in the game as well. And uh, for the other actors, it was like, either based on their recommendations or, uh, for example, Mike Bodie, who is playing one of, one of the characters as well in the game, we met once at some sound designer conference and we were, like chat a bit. And then I was thinking like, oh, he's got this voice ready that would fit in there as well. So it's kind of spoke puzzle of, you know, putting pieces together. So when you have this, you know, world that you're creating in, in an audio, you know, mystery adventure game, if you will, to really create this world, there's a lot of, um, pieces that you have to pull together because you're bringing it all through sound. So you obviously we just talked about the voice actors and you know, really having compelling, you know, strong voice actors uh, who really make you feel like the dialogue is believable. Um, and, you know, the writing is also something that people would actually say and, 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 you know, natural, but you have to weave in a whole bunch of other things. I mean, there's, you know, background ambient sounds, there's the sound of, you know, the weather is a, kind of a constant in this particular story. You have, you know, the movements of the characters, whether they're walking or picking something up or whatever the case may be. So there's a lot of uh, different sounds involved that need to be weaved together to create this world. And so if you can kind of talk a little bit about, you know, really all aspects of it, you know, how do you record those various sounds? I imagine they're all on the kind of their own tracks that you then weave together and layer over, over top of each other. Um, and how do you do that in a way that, you know, doesn't make it too cluttered uh, as well, because you, you don't want it to be, a cacophony of sound you want it to be you know kind of a natural state so if you can kind of talk about that audio design that goes into creating a game like this well um the main idea behind it was like to create a story with, uh, that you can just listen to you know you don't have to need to watch, watch anything but with the <clears throat> like the ideas that you have kind of move without the picture you know so, so that you have this really high quality sound in the movies you know and uh, so I took the similar approach as, as when doing the sound for for the film. So this is the reason why there's really, as you mentioned, everything like uh, each of the character we recorded for each of the characters, like their movements, their footsteps, you know, their uh, clothes, uh, sounds of the clothing, and everything. Also, there is, uh, as you mentioned, all the ambiences and so on. So you got the really feeling of kind of you know being in the space. Which uh, is also that the game is mixed in uh, binaural audio, so we got you know this imitation of you know like uh, 3D sound. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was the idea, and yeah, as as you mentioned, we kind of had to uh, 
I said the workflow for it. So uh, we got uh, yeah, all, all the cards are on sounds. Then we got separate layers for, for the ambiences, which are in, in the case of this game, like something like dynamic that, you know, it's not at the moment, there's still a sound of thunder, but you know, it evolves as, as, as we need to. That's one of the features in FMO you can do that you kind of mix the various layers in, in between them and it kind of gives some randomization. So it's the sound is not the same uh, when, when you play it like twice, at least oh, for, for ambiences. I don't so, think I picked up yeah, on that, that there, that there was some okay. you know, variability to some of that background noise. Yeah, so, so, so it was also about one of the like, ideas that, because when you were like listening to, because there are some places when you kind of get back and forth, I, I think that, for example, the lobby, you enter it a few times, or there are some places where you spend some time. So it would be like annoying if you got just, I don't know, 30 second loop and it, you know, just repeat itself uh, on and on. So we wanted to be really like uh, alive, the, uh, you know, the ambience. And also there are many like uh, special sound effects, you know, all the, I don't know, for example, some fighting sounds, uh, uh, also uh, some the characters do, uh, there are some things like with drinking, you know, some things that they are searching some stuff, you know, so yeah, we had to either find these uh, sounds in some uh, sound banks or some databases, or we had to record them in our uh, Foley stage and, you know, create like everything from scratch. So it was uh, quite a uh, lengthy uh, process but uh, yeah I, I think it's worth it because uh, it's really making the world believable that you really kind of feel in there so that's that's interesting so you kind of mix i was going to ask this question so you kind of mixed buying some sound packs if you will so maybe something that's generic like clinking of glasses or maybe even the the, the footsteps maybe you buy those because you know there you can kind of do that but it you may have had to record something unique, like someone shuffling through a drawer or, or, you know, the fight, you know, when there's kind of a fight or a scuffle, because those are kind of unique and you probably can't just pick those up off a shelf. Uh, well, actually, uh, also the, the footsteps is the one thing that we were recording because as you mentioned, there are a lot of like sound banks where you can download footsteps, but um, it might, it might think it's uh, not that important, but even in the footsteps, you kind of make, uh, let's say, characterize you know if they uh, come closer to you slowly or you know you got this fast tempo you can play with the surfaces they are work, uh, they are you know working on so uh, we did all the like footsteps movement we already recorded in, in the studio so it's not uh, not for some things but it's uh, you know done for a certain situation where we want it to be in there so if you're doing something like you know, footsteps on different services and you're recording that yourself. I mean, you, you put somebody in shoes and you just put like a, you know, a, a mic on a pole kind of close to their foot to kind of record it. Is that, you know, the, yeah, the well, but, of actually we, we did the, the footsteps and the sounds in uh, dedicated Foley stage in the studio in, in, in Sun Square that we are recording. And there are various like, you know, these uh, one to one meter small surfaces. Like, so there's a little piece of wooden surface, a little piece of, uh, I don't know, uh, grass, uh, sand. So you can just flip quickly between these surfaces and, you know, record it on what, what surface you need to do it. So it's recorded in studio, but we got these options, you know, to choose what we, what we want to. What would you say is the most um, maybe underappreciated sound that you've weaved into the game, you know, you know, there's some things that kind of stand <laughs> out, like, you know, the storm and stuff like that. But it, is there something you're like, this is so minute, it's, you know, the, the the fabric moving on somebody's shirt that we bothered to record just to make this world rich? Is there is there some, you know, underappreciated sound that you bothered to put into the game? I think it's actually the fabric you mentioned, because the fabric is in there all the time. It's like uh, there's a long, you know, uh, in each scene, the Alice, we get like, uh, everything is recorded, so even slide this movement, and it's like that you don't, you know, you don't even kind. Of, I think uh, realize it, but when you turn, when you mute the fabric sounds, it's kind of the characters are not alive. It's just like voice coming from somewhere. But when you connect the voice with the sound of fabric, which is really like in most cases unnoticeable, then you kind of feel there's a there's a person. You know, you can like uh, hear it, and it, that's that's really like big difference even though that you kind of uh, don't think about it when you play the game yeah that's some you know weight and gravity to the character that they're actually filling a space if you will yeah exactly would you say you know 
So there's kind of a, a first part that that starts in kind of the the seventies, and and then uh, most of the story takes place in the eighties, kind of mid eighties. And you know, I was kind of thinking, all right, well, why did they settle it in this time? And and I was thinking, you know, for some of the the points, like you know, I don't think this is giving anything away, but in the beginning, you know, Alice is typing on a typewriter. Um, did you set it in the eighties? And you know, and a little later, she's like, you know, doing something with a cassette tape. Um, was the 80s so that you could add those type of sounds because kind of modern technology is, you know, silent in a lot of ways and you wouldn't really have, you know, sounds to kind of fill the world if you made it set in 2022? Well, uh, I think even in 2022, you can fill this, the world with sounds and it's just like a digital beeping and or whatever. Um, I think, again, the main reason was the inspiration by, by Stephen King, but because he got most of his stories set in 80s. But also there's one, one point, um, because there's, uh, I, I, again, I don't want to spoil much, but it's slightly like in the, this mystery level that, uh, you know, they are questioning whether the hotel is haunted or, you know, whether it's not. And I think just this stuff works better in the 80s because now, you know, like these um, haunted stories, you know, that, uh, like some police officer would believe that the hotel is haunted. Uh, it just feel not as natural that, you know, it would be like 40 years ago. So that was also the reason why we said it slightly back in the back in the past gotcha so you know one of the particular reasons that we're sitting here talking today i i run a group that is you know called mobile accessible games and so it's all about games that are accessible for those who are blind and visually impaired and evidence 111 has a whole dedicated accessibility mode to it so you know why don't you tell people a little bit about you know what are the features of that mode? And then also how did that mode come into existence? Like, how did you think that we need to include accessibility into our game? So uh, the mode is, uh, I, I think it's kind of, you know, uh, similar to, uh, real, it's there to guide you through the game. And uh, we base the controls of the game, like the working with the app and swiping. So everything you do in there is uh, done by swiping either one or by two fingers. And uh, dedicated mode is there, so there's no buttons. So the you know the talkback or the voiceover function is, is just does have nothing like you know to read it to. So in each screen or in each segment of the game, there's this narrator voice that's saying you like what are your options if you swipe left, if you swipe right, and so on. Um, we decided to uh, do it this way was because uh, I think that when you for this particular. Uh, Kind of the experience, you know, when you listen to a story, I want to be kind of, you know, inside it. And uh, if in, in the middle of the story you, you will hear the talkback voice, which is still slightly unnatural, it really likes, you know, take you out of the story. So we wanted to keep the players as much inside of the story as is possible. So it was probably the main reason behind our, behind, you know, putting our own uh, integration of accessibility mode. Yeah, I mean, that, that's one thing I particularly liked about it is, you know, right at the beginning, you have kind of a narrator who says, you know, you know, for their first choice, you would swipe right, and your second choice, you'd swipe left. And if you're answering, you know, yes, you swipe right. If you're answering no, you swipe left. Kind of tells you that. But then once you're in the story, you know, he, he doesn't pop in and say that anymore. Um, you know, you you kind of, um, you know, just have Alice. And I, I was going to ask, but Alice will, you know, in the story be like, should I go down into, to, you know, outside into the storm or should I stay and check out, you know, this room? Um, th that kind of inner monologue that she's having with herself about what are the choices, is that only in the voiceover feature to kind of give an auditory cue of what the two choices are? Or is that also for those who, uh, you know, have sight, is she also kind of monologuing, if you will? Yeah, uh, the, the difference between like when you turn on and of the assistant is really with the with the narrator's voice, like, you know, this, I have a voice of God or the guide. So when you turn turn it off, uh, you can see, you know, writings on the screen with, with like buttons, what, what, when you swipe right, there is this new game, when you swipe left, it's a recent game. But uh, the idea in the, like in the beginning was to create a game that you really don't have to like watch the screen or your phone. So even though, uh, like there are some key uh, keywords for these options that, you know, as you mentioned, there's, for example, yes or no on the screen, but the Alice voice is there like for everyone. So even as people who, you know, uh, who are sighted can just listen to it and without watching the display, they can swipe left or right and continue the game. 
the other thing that's uh, great about the system that you have in place is it operates without you know the iPhone voiceover having to be on, which is great in an audio type of game because you don't want voiceover kind of stepping over what's being said and also pulling you out of the story. So you can turn off voiceover, still fully, you know, activate and make the choices through your game without voiceover, you know, stepping all over the, the, the gameplay, if you will. Yeah, as I said, we wanted you know, not to be interrupted by editing uh, when, you, when you play the game. <laughs> I also noticed, uh, you know, I read through your press kit and I noticed, you know, some of the voice actors, I forget which one off the top of my head, but I noticed that some of the voice actors had done other games with accessibility. And I was just wondering if, you know, you learned any interesting perspectives from them about how to make an accessible game or what works from an accessibility standpoint or, you know, any of the experience of anybody else at Play By Ears, you know, prior experience with accessibility that you really, you know, leveraged to pull into this game. Well, um... Not not from the voice actors. Actually, it was uh, <laughs> quite a surprise for me as well. I, I uh, when I when I found it out, like uh, I I was like you know picking up the uh, voice actors uh, with uh, regarding for, like if they've done some stuff for visually impaired or not. But uh, I think the most valuable for us was uh, uh, consultations with organization here in Czech. It's called SONS, uh, so S O N S. And uh, we are like developing the uh, accessibility mode with them, and uh, it was quite funny when I first approached them and I brought my mobile phone and I, you know, so now, now you can try it. And like uh, the first thing I think he, uh, uh, the, the the guy in the organization did was that he uh, accidentally turned off the app and uh, and turned on my Facebook app because you know the, the system was not, not like working properly. So we spent some time like to talk about how it should be, what what he would like to be in there, and uh, then we kind of iterated the, the system. And I think this was the most helpful for us, you know, when we actually like uh, could uh, get this feedback from from the community. And also after the release uh, of the Czech version, uh, we did some minor changes that you know they asked there would be nice to have. So uh, this was very helpful for us. What made you do accessibility in the first place? I mean, there, there's you know a lot of developers don't even realize that uh, you know there's a thing called voiceover on the iPhone that allows blind people to kind of access applications. You know, what kind of made you aware of the need for accessibility? Well, uh, it was just like thinking that we are, you know, creating this audio game and like almost from the beginning, because, you know, when you decided, uh, wow, we want to make a game is just playable, you know, without watching on your uh, on your phone, then you kind of think, okay, so it would be great that even, even you know, blind players can, uh, can play it. So we got this, you know, demo version, and then we were thinking like, okay, but um, maybe we should check whether it's like, you know, uh, okay for them to play because they might have. I, I was, I think, googling or something, you know, about these accessibility features. Like then I come across uh, voiceover and talkback, and yeah, so this was the reason why we approached them because we wanted like, you know, to make sure that uh, it works uh, for everyone. Uh, so. Yeah, that was the reason. Like, uh, we wanted everyone to be uh, happy and to use the app, like you know, uh, as smooth as possible. What would you say is the biggest you know, roadblock for a developer such as yourself for adding in accessibility? Is it time? Is it money? Is it awareness? Well, um, I think like, in this particular case, it really may be the awareness that you really like have to think about it because, uh, uh, like. In total, for us, it was not, not like such a difficult task to edit, uh, and uh, but also it was, I think, the reason because as the game was from the beginning created uh, with the uh, intention of not watching on the display, so it was just you know adding this layer of uh, this narrator who is guiding you through through the uh, through the story, but. Uh, you know the controls were uh, we were like thinking of them from the beginning that you you shouldn't see the see the display. So I think in this case was uh, was the awareness. But in general, I think it might be like the game design of the game itself that you may want to have some feature, and then you kind of think it's important, you know, to implement it the accessibility features and the accessibility uh, option. So yeah, this might be maybe like uh, difficult for the developers to you know, uh, implement it or, you know, or to omit some features they'd like to have in the game instead of using the, uh, the accessibility.
So Evidence 111 comes out November 15th, so uh, I believe that's Tuesday next week. And once it, you know, hits the stores, what are you going to, you know, like, how do you gauge that it's been a success? You know, what what defines success for you in this case after you've released the game on the 15th? Um, I think there are two points of views. Uh, uh, one is, like, if the people will like it, and also if the community of, uh, you know, who's playing accessible games or blind or visually impaired uh, players will like it. And I think with the Czech version, it was really, like, uh, amazing the response we got from the from the players and they were writing us messages that they, it was, like, really amazing experience because, um, for example, here, I think even it's more difficult for the visually impaired players uh, to get some games because uh, there's a... I think quite a huge language barrier. You know, there are really not like uh, 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 accessible games in Czech language. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, it was really like a, not nice to have uh, such a game here in Czech Republic. So uh, this is one one uh, one one side of the coin, and uh, also we would love to do uh, like more stories. Uh, we got some some ideas already. Uh, so you know, if the game at least like pay for itself and gives us some spare uh, spare uh, amount to develop next, it would be great uh, that we can continue uh, you know with making more and more stories. Yeah, I, I think it's a really um, interesting point or, or you know, point in time for audio games, you know, and audio stories like this because with that binaural sound, you know, three D sound, I mean, it really builds and makes the world rich. Where you know, in the past. It, was, it seemed a lot flatter. I mean, you can feel people moving from one side of a room to another. You can hear people being closer and walking farther away from you. It, it really kind of does a better job of immersing you in the world. And when you do what you guys did, which is kind of, you know, layer in the voices and background noises and, and you know, the detail of the cloth uh, and the clothes that are being moved and the storm outside. I mean, it really does pull you into that world where you can kind of picture what is happening. Uh, in a way that I don't think was really as as possible before, just because of you know from an audio sound design technology uh, wasn't there. So uh, you know I think there's uh, lots of great stories I can tell that can really kind of pull people in. Yeah, and uh, I, I think it's quite uh, quite interesting topic you mentioned about the technology because uh, um, we had this idea like for the audio game for a really long time. I think like our first email was into two fifteen. And then we're just like thinking and tinkering with the idea. And uh, at the time, it was kind of beginning of, you know, the new virtual reality era, like with all the headsets coming out. And uh, it, you know, get also to, to audio. And in the beginning, I got like three, uh, like this, uh, how it sounds at the moment is, uh, I think, third iteration, because there I got, uh, before I got two different prototypes, you know, different plugins and different, like, uh, settings, which did not sound as good. But, you know, the technology that is not, like the plugins we are using at the moment, we're not, you know, uh, at the time available. So it's really like the question of last couple of years that it's possible to do it in this quality that we wanted to do it, like, you know, that it sounds really uh, very immersive that a few years ago, it wouldn't be probably possible to be as, as good as now. Yeah, absolutely. So again, Evidence 111 comes out November 15th. Obviously people can support you by purchasing the game uh, on day one as it gets released on November 15th. But, you know, what are other ways that, uh, you know, the blind and visually impaired community of gamers can kind of support a developer like you who's creating, games that they, you know, can enjoy and have really taken the time to ensure that they're accessible. What, what other ways can we support you? Well, I think uh, the best way is to tell your friends or, you know, if you like the game, like to uh, to tell others to try it and to play it. And, uh, you know, if there's like, you know, enough people who like the game and, and uh, for example, buy it or just, you know, tell others about it, then I think that's the most uh, valuable help we could, we could get. And um, I will have in the description notes of this interview, um, you, you've shared with me uh, a variety of different social media platforms uh, that you're on. So, you know, please be sure to follow Play By Ears there so you can see any updates on this game and, and all future games. Um, you know, speaking of that, you know, what is your next step? Is there updates to this particular Evidence 111? Are you ready to move on to you know, your next uh, idea? What What's kind of the next step for Play By Ears? 
Uh, I think there's going to be definitely some bug fixing, even though we uh, we try to you know uh, think of any possible scenario, but there's always something. Uh, but actually, at the moment, we are um, working on another. Uh, it's quite smaller game compared to evidence, uh, and we are working on a Czech version, which is coming out this year. And uh, if everything goes well, you know, uh, we'd like to work also on the English version of the second game. So maybe next year uh, we could get more uh, another story. How long does it take you to, you know, like from, you know, the the one page write up about what evidence one 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 would be about to you know, putting out your Czech version of it, you know, how much time does that take? Uh, I think it's diff difficult to measure because uh, me and Michael, we both do it like in our free time. It's not our main job. So uh, it's also depends on the, you know, how much time we, we, we can spare, but um, the evidence took us um, about like two years uh, of development uh, for the Czech version and also for the English, but with the English it was more of you know like preparations and uh, uh, talking with, with the voice actors, you know. So we are working on it mostly this year. And for the uh, for the second game, as, as I mentioned, it's it's smaller and also we got this kind of you know workflow things done. So I think from the beginning till the end, it's it was around one year year or something. Do you, do you think you know each time you do a game, you know? In some ways, it'll be faster because you're more efficient. You know how to do certain things, so you can, you know, you're not figuring it out because you've had the experience of creating, you know, evidence one one one, and now this this, this second game that each game in some ways uh, will be faster, um, you know, to actually do whatever it is you're attempting to do. Uh, in some ways, yes, but also it's like you know you got this idea that you would like to do. So we can say, oh, we will do it. We will do it in next game, and then you'll start figuring how to do uh, do things differently in the next game. So uh, even in this one, we are, we will be releasing in Czech Republic. Uh, the system of controls is slightly different, so we have to figure it out how how you know how it could work. And uh, yeah, so there's uh, always something that you know takes time to to develop and to think of it. Well, Tom, I really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us. Tell us about your game, Evidence 111. Again, it's coming out on November 15th, so feel free to check it out. Um, I have had an opportunity to play the game as an advanced copy. I can tell you that it is fully accessible for those who are completely blind um, as well as visually impaired. So be uh, sure to check it out. Uh, great storyline, great voice acting. Like I said, I was very impressed with the voice acting. And again, with the, uh, the modern 3D technology on audio sound, it really uh, they did a great job of weaving in, uh, you know, layered sound effects to really kind of pull you into that world. So, Tom, I really uh, appreciate you taking the time to speak with me, as well as creating a game that is accessible and really kind of focusing in and thinking through that accessibility mode. Um, it really is um, a, a valuable resource to, you know, gamers who, um, you know, kind of rely on the audio and rely on things like voiceover to navigate games. So I appreciate the time that you took to do that. So for uh, inviting me and uh, hope that you'll like the game and everyone who have tried it. And again, if you want to check out um, what's going on and updates from, from Play By Ears, um, I will have all of their social media in the description of this video. So free, feel free to, um, you know, look at their website, uh, like their Facebook, et cetera. Um, you'll be sure to follow them. They're doing some great work here in the kind of audio mystery adventure story. So again, Tom, thank you so much, and we look forward to uh, your future games. Yeah. Bye, everyone.